Welcome to lecture 28, in which we will discuss two input NAND gate implementations of Boolean functions. And uh, I don't believe this topic will take us very long, and so this will be a good opportunity for us to review a few ideas from recent quizzes that I want to make sure didn't uh, slip by you. So let me first return uh, to lecture 24. Maybe it's 23. Oops. Let me take a break. I'm having trouble finding what I want to. Wait just a second here. Okay, here's what I wanted to show you. This is uh, on quiz number 23. We had uh, this question. We said that suppose that in the dense coding algorithm, all the steps are followed exactly as described in the book and in lecture 23, except that the initial entangled pair that is distributed Alice and Bob is 1 over square root of 2, 0, 1 plus 1, 0, instead of uh, the usual 1 over square root of 2, 0, 0 plus 1, 1. And we ask, what will Bob measure uh, when Alice wants to send 0, 0, when she wants to send 0, 1, when she wants to send 1, 0, and when she wants to send 1, 1? And the answer uh, turned out to be, for this first one, uh, when she wants to send zero zero, Bob will receive, he will measure zero one. And when she wants to send zero one, he will measure zero zero. When she wants to send one zero, he will measure one one. And when she wants to send one one, he will measure one zero. In other words, in every case, his first qubit will agree with the first bit that Alice wants to send, but the second qubit will be exactly the opposite, uh, the, the uh, complement of what she wants to send. And so uh, the observation that I wanted to make here is just a very simple observation that if um, Bob put an X gate, you know, the inverter gate, on his second qubit before measuring it, then he would measure exactly what Alice wanted him to measure. So that was just a, a, a brief observation of how this could be straightened out. The next observation is a little bit more involved, but I think you'll find it interesting. And this deals with uh, uh, lectures 23 and 24. So let's uh, start with 23. Now, lectures 23 and 24 are about dense coding and quantum teleportation. And the book described, and this was mentioned a little bit in our lecture, the book described how in some sense dense coding and quantum teleportation are uh, inverses of each other. And I want to show that that extends, that idea extends to what we did in our quizzes, which might not have been uh, obvious to you at the time. So let's go back here to lecture 23. Um, now I will remind you that in the in the dense coding algorithm Alice is wanting to send uh, a classical number, a two-bit classical number. It's one of these four, 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1, 1. And in, in the usual dense coding algorithm uh, these transformations here are the transformations that she would apply in each of those four different cases. These are the transformations that she would apply to her first qubit of the entangled pair that she and Bob have. 
and so the uh, transformations are in the order I, X, Z, Y. Now, our question in uh, this pro pro problem at the end of lecture 23 was if um, Alice put these in a different order, and instead of I, X, Z, Y, if she put them in this order, I, Z, Y, X, and uh, so, so if she put them in this different order, then what tr transformation here could Bob substitute for the C naught gate that he would usually use in the dense coding algorithm at this point? What transformation could he substitute that would uh, allow him to end up getting the same results as he would when he uses a C naught gate here and Alice uses this this order for the transformations I, X, Z, Y. And you will remember you found this matrix, but what you might not have uh, noticed was that the matrix that you found is exactly this matrix <laughs> that we used in the problem at the end of lecture 24. And we said that uh, there, where we're talking about quantum teleportation, remember that Alice now will apply first a C-naught and then a Hadamard trans transformation to those first two qubits that she has and we and we, in our problem we said well what if instead of applying the C naught what if Alice applied this so again now in the in, in, in the quiz 23 we said that if Alice applied her transformations in a, in a different order what transformation could Bob substitute for C naught in order to undo that and this turned out to be the matrix so now we're supposing that Alice uses this instead of the C naught gate in the quantum teleportation algorithm and lo and behold we found out that if she does that and Bob wants everything uh, remember we said uh, the question here was if Alice conducts the rest of her steps as described in the lecture, what transformation should Bob apply in order to have the you know the desired result here uh, that that the um, unknown state is indeed um, teleported from Alice to Bob? And you will remember that the answers here turned out to be. exactly these I Z Y X instead of what Bob would usually have which was I X Z Y so uh, this makes it look even more like the quantum teleportation and dense coding algorithms are inverses of each other so those were two notes uh, that I wanted to make sure you had caught uh, two observations and uh, this last one, you know, you might need to think about it a little more uh, in a little more detail, but, but you'll see, I think it, with a little bit of um, thought, you'll see, uh, I'm hoping, what, what I'm talking about there. And so there is one more uh, observation I'd like to make, and it concerns the um, uh, lecture at the end of 20, uh, lecture 26. This, we have this problem here. This was the second problem in lecture 26. And um, I would like to, well, you will remember that um, I gave you the hint that you might want to use the uh, approach of just having a truth table. And that way you could identify uh, what beta is. 
Now I want to show you another approach that is more efficient. So um, let's see how this goes. Okay, so here's the problem again. I've transferred it to uh, today's lecture, lecture 28. And uh, the, the way that I'm going to, um, or the way that I'm going to approach this is the following. So let's start with an observation here. Let's say that we have uh, three bits, which we can call X, Y, and Z. And uh, the first two bits are controlling that third one. So we know that the output on these two lines will be X and Y. Uh, but the output on the third line will depend on the values of X and Y. And if we um, constructed a truth table for this, it would look uh, as follows. We're going to have X, Y, and Z, and then I'll call the uh, output um, I'll just call that out. But I also want to um, calculate uh, one more function, and that's x, y. And you'll see why I want to calculate that in just a moment. OK, so now we're going to go through all the possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And now we calculate x, y in each case, and so uh, that's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1. Because uh, we get that information, or we get this result, because 0 ended with anything is 0. And so in each of the first six lines, either x or y or both x and y are 0. So that's why we get 0 in the first six cases. But in the last two lines, x and y are both equal to 1. And therefore, x, y is equal to 1. And now we want to um, calculate what out will be. Now. Unless x and y are both equal to 1, out will be equal to z. So we can just put z, um, we can put the value of z, which of course is, is this column right here. So we get 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 for the first six values of out. And now for the last two values of out, well, remember that uh, in those cases, uh, when x and y are both equal to 1, then this last, uh, the value on the z line will be inverted. So this 0 will become a 1, and this 1 here will become a 0. And now what I want to encourage you to do is to look at these, uh, at the two columns here, z and xy, and also at out. When z and xy are both 0, out is 0. When z and xy are both 1, out is 0. Here again, when z and xy are both 0, out is 0. 
when z and x, y are both zero, out is zero. But if z and x, y are different, if they're one and zero, then out will be one. One and zero, out will be one. One and zero, out will be one. Zero and one, out will be one. So we see that whenever z and x, y have the same value, out is zero. But whenever z and x, y have different values, then out will be equal to one. So what is out? Out, so we can say we observe that out is equal to z exclusive for x, y. And just to make sure you uh, recall what that means, um, I'll put it up here. A exclusive or B is equal to A and not B, or not A ended with B. And so you can see that, uh, for instance, if, if A and B are both zero, okay, if a and b are both zero, then the first term goes away because a is zero, the second term goes away because b is zero, so everything goes away if a and b are both zero, it's equal to zero. If a and b are both one, the first term will go away because not one, it, because b is equal to one, so not b would be zero. The second term will go away because a prime would be, one prime would be zero. So a, a exclusive or b is equal to zero if a and b are both zero or if a and b are both one. However, if they are different, if a is 0 and b is 1, let's say, then the first term disappears, but the second term is 1. And on the other hand, if a is 1 and b is 0, then the second term goes away, but the first one is 1. So a exclusive or b is equal to 1 when the two Boolean variables have different values, and 0 when they have the same value. But we're we just observed that out has that same relationship to z and the product of x and y. So this means that out is equal to z anded with x, y prime or with z prime anded with x, y. And so, uh, using that information now, let's come back up to your quiz. This was uh, the last problem on, on the uh, 26th quiz. And we have two uh, CNOT gates here. So, if we label, if we, if we first of all calculate that, maybe we can call that alpha. And so alpha would be equal to, uh, now in this case, what's coming in is zero. So we have zero ended with x, y prime. And then that gets ORed with zero prime ended with x, y. And what does that give us? Well, zero ended with anything is zero, so the first term goes away. Zero prime is one. One ended with x, y is just x, y. So alpha is equal to x, y. And now we apply the pr principle again uh, here at this point to get beta. Okay, so we get x, y, Anded with x z prime, and then that gets ORed with x y prime, ended with x z. And let's see what that will give us. Okay, here we'll have the x y, but what is x z prime? Well, we can use uh, De Morgan's theorem to say that that's equal to x prime or z prime. 
and similarly here xy quantity prime is x prime or y prime and that's ended with xz now if we multiply this out well xy ended with x prime since this has x in it and that has x prime that will be zero so we will uh, get xyz prime from this uh, first term and similarly over here x prime ended with xz goes away but uh, we do get an x y prime z term here so x y prime z and uh, you notice then that this answer agrees exactly with answer b so this is how you could have done this problem without the use of uh, the truth table so that catches us up on some uh, observations I wanted to make about recent quizzes. And now we'll get into today's topic, which is the um, two input and AND gate implementations of Boolean functions. Okay, so uh, as we said in our last lecture, we want to do things as efficiently as possible. Um, and I want to just uh, try to teach this topic through an example. So let's suppose that we had um, f of w, x, y, z is equal to uh, w prime x or uh, w x, y prime or w, x, y, z prime this is an example now if <clears throat> if we were challenged with uh, let's say implement this in an efficient way using two input NAND gates Now, one, one observation before we go any further. Um, we found out that right up here with this example, we found out that, for instance, if we have zero coming in here and we have the X and Y lines up here as our control lines, then our output for alpha will simply be XY. So we can easily, with the Toffoli gate, we can easily implement AND Furthermore, if we make this 1 a 0, then instead of getting xy, we've gotten uh, not xy. And so we can also implement NAND. So it's easy for us to implement either AND or NAND with the Toffoli gate. And so if we can get a classical circuit that's all NAND gates, then using Toffoli gates where we have NAND gates, we can easily get an efficient uh, uh, or a similarly efficient quantum circuit. So that's the idea. That's why we're motivated that Toffoli gate gives us AND and NAND very readily. And so that's, what, that's our motivation for studying uh, NAND gate implementations in the classical case. So let's say that we were challenged with trying to find uh, an efficient way to implement this function uh, using only two input NAND gates. Well, the way that uh, I recommend that you proceed is as follows. First of all, we can use the Quine-McCluskey method to write this function uh, in a minimal fashion. Now, 
since the Quine McCleskey method is involved, I won't go through all that again, but let me remind you of what the, of the steps would be. So we would um, first of all want to, th th we're not quite ready to use the Quine McCleskey method on this because we want all of the beginning terms to be min terms. In other words, we want all the beginning terms to have all of the independent variables. And so this one is missing y and z. This one is missing z. So how can we uh, remedy this? Well, we would simply rewrite f in this fashion. We could say this is w prime x. And remember, <coughs> we can always end a term with 1 without changing its value. So we could end this with y or y prime. And we could also end it with z or z prime. Now then, when we multiply all of that out, we will get four terms, which of course is, is, is a lot more involved than, than this. We'll get four terms, each of which will have four variables in it. So that's, you know, 16, 16 literal appearances of the variables rather than just the two we have here. So that certainly is a lot more involved. But then hopefully uh, when we go to the Quine McCleskey method, that might help us to uh, write, write our entire function more efficiently than this. Okay, so um, again, then if we're intending to use the Quine McCleskey method on this function, we would um, and w prime x with y or y prime and with z or z prime um, because both y and z are missing here in term, missing in, in, in so much as they're not present uh, to give us min terms which is what we want as the beginning step for the Quine McCleskey method. Okay here for the second term we would just uh, and it with z or z prime and the last term is a min term it has all the variables present so we don't have to end it with anything so uh, we would uh, so after writing this down what we would do is multiply all this out and then we would have uh, 16 terms here and two terms here so there'd be 18 we would have 19 terms all together now, some of these would uh, probably condense into each other, and so uh, if that happened, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about any, any terms like that. Actually, let's see, would any condense? Maybe. Actually, I'm not sure that any terms would condense because every term coming out of here would start with um, w prime x let's just see this one let me take a quick break okay I see now where my problem was this would with this would give not not 16 terms but four terms here uh, so we'd have four terms coming out here and two terms coming out here and one here. So four and two and one, we would get seven terms all together. And uh, indeed, none of those terms would combine with each other because all of these terms that would come out of here would have W prime X. All the terms coming out here, and, and notice that no other term has W prime X. All the terms coming out of here would have W X Y prime and that certainly doesn't match that and it certainly wouldn't match any of these and so all of these uh, seven terms that we would get the four from there the two from there and the one from there all seven of those terms uh, would be uh, different from each other so we wouldn't have any combination there but then once we got those seven terms then we could go through the, since those would all be min terms we could then go through the Quine McCleskey method and um, hopefully we would end up with an expression for f that was even more efficient than this. Now that might not be the case, but perhaps it would be the case. So let's just, uh, now again, I'm not going to go through all that because the Quine McCleskey method is rather involved, so we won't, uh, we won't do that. We've already looked at that in the 
most recent lecture. So we'll just uh, we'll say assume that the minimal sum for f is f of w x y z equals well actually let me just stop for a moment and I can find this uh, quickly offline actually I'll tell you what I won't even do it offline okay instead of doing it offline I'll do a, a something that is more uh, that is quicker than the Klein-McCluskey method and this will be a review for some of you uh, and if you don't understand what I'm doing here don't worry about it at all it's just kind of the kernel map method so if I were going to use a kernel map method for this I would proceed as follows and again I stress if you don't know about the kernel map method uh, I'm not trying to teach it here uh, I'm just uh, for those who want a brief, for those who've already seen it, this will be a very quick refresher. And if you haven't seen it, don't worry. The Quine McCluskey method is a better method for you to learn about because, as I said before, it is applicable to functions of more than five uh, independent variables. But again, for those of you who want a quick refresher, so we're going to list all the independent variables wx on the horizontal on the vertical axis, yz on the vertical uh, horizontal axis, and now we want to uh, color in, or we want to fill in all the uh, terms we have. So w prime x will be uh, this one 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 because that's the uh, we have zero for w and one for x. So that's the w prime x. It'll lead to those four terms and that corresponds to the four terms that you would get if you multiplied this out. wxy prime is uh, one one and then zero for y so we get uh, the, these two terms right here. That's wx uh, y prime. And again, these two ones correspond to the two terms you would get when you did this. And then wx, y, z prime, okay, wx is this row, and then y, z prime would be a one over here. So now, uh, this is the kernel map, and now we want to see uh, what our groupings will be. And uh, so we have 16 cells all together. Are there any groupings of 16 ones? No. Are there any groupings of 8 ones? No. So what about groupings of 4 ones? Yes, we have two such groupings. One of them is right here. And so and these are going to be our prime implicants. And I'll just draw a little sketch above each one that I identify. So that's one grouping, and uh, that is the grouping x, y prime. Another grouping of four would be this. And that is the grouping w prime x. And uh, those are the only groupings of uh, four that we have. Oh, no, 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 sorry about that. There is one more grouping of four, and it's this. These two right here grouped with these two right here. That one's easy to miss. That's another reason uh, that I prefer the Klein-McCluskey method, uh, at least for some cases. Uh, I know it's more involved, it takes a lot longer, but you see we almost missed, or at least I almost missed that grouping of four with the Carnot-Matt method, but with the Quine-Mokleski method it's really impossible 
to miss things. Uh, you know, it's just sort of automatic. Okay, so what about this last grouping of four? Uh, that consists of these two and these two. Well, that will be, the name for that one will be uh, x z prime. Okay, so those are the prime uh, applicants, and then when we uh, want to identify the essential prime implicants, well, the last one that we just identified, we, we see that this is an essential one cell, and this is an essential one cell, and this is an essential one cell, and that's enough to tell us that all of the prime implicants are indeed essential prime implicants. And therefore, the minimal sum for this function, there's only one. And it is f of w, x, y, z equals x, y prime or w prime x or x, z prime. So I encourage you, um, if you... Um, uh, well, first of all, let me repeat one more time. If you didn't understand what I did just in the kernel maps, don't worry. Uh, what you want to learn is the quantum McCluskey method. But here you have another a good problem. Now that you know the answer for this, you have another good problem to practice with the quantum McCluskey, and I don't think that this one will take too long, so I encourage you to do that. But now then I don't have to say assume anymore. We'll say the minimal sum. expression for f is and we have uh, f of w x y z equals x y prime or w prime x or x z prime and again, that's obtainable through either the Carnot map method or the quantum McCluskey method. And one more, one, one final note before we uh, proceed. This is a minimal sum, which means that it is the, um, this is this is called a sum of products expression here because you can see the pluses. So it is a sum, and each term that's being added together is a pure product of the Boolean variables. And this is the, um, expression that would minimize the number of literals, which is the number of appearances of these variables. Is not this is this doesn't necessarily end up giving us the fewest number of NAND gates in our final implementation, but it's a a, a good bet that it will come close. So this is what we'll do is we'll use uh, if you're challenged to find an efficient um, implementation of some uh, a two input and AND gate implementation then what you should do first is use the uh, quantum McCluskey method to uh, find a minimal sum and then once you have that minimal sum then what do you do? So we'll say now how do we implement this using only two input NAND gates. Let me make sure you understand the difficulty. Right now, if you implemented this directly, well, to implement this, we would need an AND gate. To implement this, we would need an AND gate. To implement this, we would need an AND gate. And then once we got those three terms, then we would need a three input OR gate to OR them all together. We don't want to do that. We want to use only two input NAND gates to implement the entire function. So how do we do it? 
Well, my recommendation to you is the following. Okay, we, we write down this function, xy prime or w prime x or xz prime. And we make this observation. That function is equal to itself complemented twice. Now, you'll see why we want to write it in that way in just a moment. So, what we're going to do is consider this to be the following. We'll have xy prime or w prime x or xz prime prime and then another prime outside. Now the prime on the outside we're going to leave as it is. But the prime on the inside of the bracket we will get rid of using De Morgan's theorem. Now De Morgan's theorem again as we uh, observed in our previous class it says that the complement of a sum is the product of the individual complements. So we have x, y, prime, prime, handed with w prime x, prime, handed with x, z, prime, prime. Again, the complement, remember the prime is complement, so the complement of a sum is the product, see these are all handed together now, rather than being ORed together, they're ANDed together, is the product of the individual complements. So we have the complement of this first term, the complement of the second term, and the complement of the third term. Those are all being ANDed together. And so that is equal to the term in the brackets, and then outside the brackets, we leave that exactly as it was before. And notice now, that um, if we if we look at this, this is a two input NAND here. We are ANDing and then complementing, so that's NANDing. We are NANDing together X and Y prime. Here we are NANDing together W prime and X, and here we are NANDing together X and z prime. So this can be implemented assuming that we have all the variables in both their complemented and uncomplemented forms then this can be implemented with a two input NAND, this can be implemented with a two input NAND, and this can be implemented with a two input NAND. And let me also add that if you're troubled by that stipulation that we have access to the uh, complements of the variables, if you don't like to assume that, if you'd like to assume that we only start with W, X, Y, and Z, well that's fine as well because we can easily put the uh, X gate, the, you know, the inverter gate or uh, on a line to get the complement of a variable. So it would be easy for us to get this Y prime uh, from Y. It would be easy for us to get W prime from W and easy for us to get Z prime from Z and then once we got those primed variables then we can using the Toffoli gate we know that uh, we can implement this NAND function and here's our two input NAND here's a two input NAND and here's a two input NAND can you see what the problem is? There's only one problem here before we can finish. So take a moment to look at that and see if you can identify it. Well again, this can be implemented with two input NAND, this can be implemented with two input NAND, this can be implemented with two input NAND. But how do we implement this? Because this is three terms that we want to NAND together and uh, 
but we're supposed to use only two input NAN gates. Well, if we're thinking about Toffoli gates, we could always, we know that Toffoli can be used for either AND or NAND very readily. And so with the Toffoli gates, what we could do is we could use the Toffoli gate to AND these two together, AND those two together. And then once we got that result, we could then AND that with this, which we would obtain with another two input NAND gate. And then we, once we got all that, we could invert that, again with the Toffoli gate, to get this final function. Since that is really, uh, you know, you know, what I've just said is what we want to think about because we're, uh, our ultimate goal is to develop quantum circuits, and that's where we'll be using the Toffoli gate. And so I think that that is better to come up here Let's just change the title of this lecture a little bit because I think that uh, it'll be better for us to just think of it like this. To in, uh, let's say, let's say implementation of Boolean functions using two input and gates. Well, let's just say, well, we'll say, we'll go ahead, we'll say uh, two input and gates, two input and gates. and inverters. This will be a better title for us. It's, it's a more accurate description of what we want to do uh, because actually down here with this problem we were working on, we could indeed, uh, it is possible to put all of this uh, in terms of only two input NAND gates, rather than using the uh, the fact that this is an AND, and then we could calculate that and then AND it with this and then invert. We, we could uh, do it all NAND implementation, but that's really not um, consistent with what we will want to do then uh, with the Toffoli gates. So let's just, since the Toffoli gate after all can be used for AND or NAND or for an inverter, and so everything we have up here, all these possibilities that we've allowed now in our title, all of those are covered by the Toffoli gate. So let's just go ahead and keep all of those. And so now then just to make sure that uh, what I said earlier was clear, so what we will do here is we'll have x, y prime, that will get Nandy together with a two input NAND gate. W prime X will be NANDed together. And then with a two input AND gate, we AND those together. Once we get that result, we will AND that with X Z prime prime, which could be obtained with a two input NAND gate. Now we AND these two things together with the two input AND gate, and then finally invert it. So we have NAND, 
NAND. And then all this is AND. This is NAND. And then those are AND. Actually, uh, no, we don't have to do it that way. We could, uh, we could do it like this. We could NAND. That is, after we get the AND of these two, and we get the NAND of these two, then we can NAND, two input NAND, for all of that to get our final result. So that is how we can take a function and write it in an efficient way, uh, implement it in an efficient way using two input NAND gates, two input AND gates, and inverters. And the good news is that all of those can be implemented with two Foley gates. So now let's look at some problems. Okay, so we'll have uh, one in-class problem on this idea. Uh, and the question is, which of the following are valid implementations of the function f of w, x, y, z equals w or x ended with y or z? And um, these are the four choices. And I'll give you a hint that uh, more than one of these is correct. And so you should uh, circle all of them that are correct, or all of them that are valid implementations. Um, and uh, one other last observation is that, uh, well, actually two, two things. You do not need to use the uh, Quine-McCleskey method to obtain the valid ones. And um, in fact, uh, you don't even, really have to use the methods of this section you could just check the truth function the, tr the truth table for each of these remember that if uh, for each one of these if they if they disagree if they have a different value from f for any for even a single one of the 16 different combinations that w x y and z could assume then they're not valid so um, take a look at these and find out which ones are valid implementations of this function and then we'll have uh, another problem along these lines in class. So that concludes this lecture and good luck.